right? Like, this has not felt like a podcast. It's been like, we're at a tournament, you know, there's been a, like, something has gone wrong with the tab and we're sitting outside <laughs> just having a conversation about stuff, which is what I love about debating these days. I actually have got a YouTube channel with like 145,000 subscribers. And like, okay, a bunch of kids came out from the debate club and like, can we get a selfie? That was nice. But then at the end of it, there was like a bunch of people waiting who were like, dude, are you the guy of the YouTube channel? Like, are you are you that Ashish? I'm like, oh yeah, that's actually me. This is a funny thing I noticed. I'm not sure if you think this is true. I get the feeling that like right-wing debaters enjoy debating more, or at least like they enjoy argumentation and exchange of ideas more than left-wing debaters. I think, so I think debating is definitely a liberal bubble. I think it might actually be slightly less liberal a bubble now than it was just a couple of years back. I mean, it's weird because when I first started university debating, I rapidly became a lot more left-wing, right? My, my political positions became a lot more left-wing just from the people I was meeting, the arguments I was making. And then I ended up meeting some of like the actual crazy left-wing types. And then I was like, Jesus, what the fuck is wrong with these people, right? <laughs>
And um, it has helped me throughout like the debating stuff to kind of have something completely different as for myself that is not competitive. Because I, obviously I enjoy the competition, but uh, it's good to have something for the soul, you know. Sometimes yeah, debating stuff for the soul. And you know what the weird thing is about like the, the like music for me? It's no, I mean, and I think you, I'm not sure if you feel this as well, but you know when you get really, really good, like world-class level good at one activity, which is like debating, it's so interesting to then pursue other activities where you are really shit, right? And then like, yeah. and then you kind of go, oh, it's actually quite pleasurable to be shit at something. Like English needs a word for this. Like, like the pleasure of being shit at something. Um, I don't think there's a word for it, but there should be one. Yeah, I think it's connected to the fact that uh, um, maybe before you have certain achievements in certain type of area that you decide that you like, you kind of lack the confidence. But then once you get the, these achievements, you have the confidence of, okay, if I put myself uh, uh, into something, uh, I can potentially be very good at it. And it kind of uh, allows you to... Uh, pick out different stuff. So maybe if I do this and I uh, work hard on it, maybe I can do a couple of uh, good stuff on, in that area as well. So I think it's I, all about confidence. Yeah. I, I think there's another thing as well, though, you know, which is when you do something and you're not good at it, you must be doing it just because you love it. And like, you know, there's some people who are really good at debating, but clearly don't enjoy and should just stop because it's clearly bad for them. I won't name any names, but there was a bunch of people I judged at Madrid Worlds. I'm like, look, you're clearly good at this game, but you clearly fucking hate every second you're doing it, right? Like, why are you here? Like, go home, spend some time with friends, you know? Whereas, like, there are lots of people who are not, like, amazing at debating, don't have great CVs, but are really fun to watch because they enjoy it. I get a sense, by the way, that, like, you you definitely enjoy it. At least when I watch you in the outruns, I got the sense you definitely were enjoying yourself. That was great to see. <laughs> yeah, I think I think me and Roman are uh, definitely an example for that. I think mainly this has been like the bigger driver, right? Because uh, w w basically, like, I'm not going to get too much into that, but uh, we did a lot of debating before actually going into the international scene. And uh, once we decided to kind of give it a proper try and go to international competitions, it came from a very good perspective of like, I enjoy this, I want to do it more. And uh, I, I've always preached that uh, it's always good to do debating for young kids or whatever, but at certain point, if you want to really get competitive, you have to ask yourself, do I really love the game? Do I really enjoy it? Or is it just, uh, you know, something that maybe I'll put on my CV? Because I genuinely think that people who think like that uh, don't really understand how undervalued debating will ever be on their CV or whatever. And it, if they are doing it for that, they're not going to have a really good time, especially since it's not really going to help them, I don't know, get into Harvard or whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, to. it's not. Yeah. Like, you know, when, when you tell parents, when parents ask you what's the benefits of debating, you say the main benefit of debating is that you get to meet interesting people and it's quite fun. That's really it. Um, this is a funny thing I noticed. I'm not sure if you think this is true. I get the feeling that like right-wing debaters enjoy debating more, or at least like they enjoy argumentation and exchange of ideas more than left-wing debaters. Like I, I just, I mean, because I, I'm fairly left-wing myself, but like a lot of the people I've enjoyed debating the most with have been fairly right-wing because I feel like they're motivated to debate for the same reasons I am, which like I think it's really fun to look at ideas um, and to like, you know, throw them up against each other. I'm not sure you get that sense. Well, I think uh, the obvious answer here is that, uh, at least from my perspective, if you tend to disagree with uh, certain things in debating, certain liberal bias that is put in debating, maybe some liberal arguments that uh, don't require as much analysis, you kind of get extra motivated to uh, maybe prove a point. I think... Uh, uh, Ruben already talked about this on the podcast, why uh, the semis of Worlds this year was his favorite debate ever. And it uh, was really profound for him to have that experience because he got to, you know, push uh, push a little bit harder against the liberal bias. That's it's a fact in debating. It's not always for the worst, but sometimes it is. Yeah, no, it's definitely there. I mean, I'm glad you like the semis because I think I suggested that motion. <laughs> and then well, I spent a lot well, of time... 
I spent a lot of time convincing people that there was like a really good prop, and then people were like, but that just means there's no up. And I was like, oh god, we're doing this dumb thing again, right? So when I heard that you guys and I think um, Hadar and, and Co were on the, the prop, I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun set of debates. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, so. Our, my initial reaction to the motion was because we were CG, was like, Okay, I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but I think we're on the right side of history, uh, which kind of uh, alleviated some of the pressure in the prep time. And the yeah. funny thing is, um, we came up with like, uh, I don't know, five or six uh, main ideas that we could run. And uh, our OG ran what we consider the weakest argument in the round. Oh, yeah, I'm um, sorry. OG was, OG was awful. <laughs> Like, I mean, like, what the hell was going on? I mean, they're, they're very good debaters, but, you know, sometimes people have bad days, right? I'm no stranger to that. But, yeah. I mean, after I heard, like, the first PM, I mean, I was judging that round, so I shouldn't say this. But I will say it. I was like, yeah, CG is going through. <laughs> like, CG is CG is so through at the end of the PM speech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were, we were very um, surprised. I mean, uh, nothing, uh, nothing against the... <laughs> OG team from Sydney. They, I've seen them the great rounds. They were one of the teams that I was uh, kind of potentially worried about because we didn't get to debate them as much. But maybe it is a problem of um, running what you are expected uh, to run in a certain case because of the liberal bias. I think that's kind of the problem, right? It's not that uh, these liberal arguments are not good per se. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I think that in many situations they're even better because uh, the foundations of those arguments are quite uh, something that many people right yeah. now agree, if, even if they're considered more right-wing or left-wing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I think that's that's the thing that uh, we should really be thinking about. It. Like, this is something that me and Roman have uh, kind of always been happy to, mm. you know, uh, to talk about and it's kind of you need to get creative and you if you're running a right wing or a left wing or whatever type of argument it's uh, you just need to get the gist of it and uh, you don't run it because uh, you think people will buy it you run it because you think it's a persuasive idea to to, to present in a, in a debate so yeah i mean um, as you say as you say that's uh, that's kind of a motivating factor uh, especially for some uh, debaters, uh, I think uh, it's it's uh, very connected to what we actually run in that round, which is that uh, maybe some people who are considered more right-wing uh, feel kind of left out of the conversations, yeah. especially more in the West. Uh, I'm not sure, like, coming from Bulgaria, from Eastern Europe, that is a particular problem. But here we have maybe a little bit of the reverse problem that I've seen in certain cases, uh, maybe because some more right-wing ideas are more prevalent. So left-wing debaters are more motivated to kind of push out, call out uh, certain biases. So I think it's, it could work also in the reverse, but for the international scene, it definitely looks like uh, this is an extra motivating factor. Mm. Um, so, so I want to I wanna, um, I wanna ask you in, in terms of this, do you think that uh, this kind of liberal bubble, let's say, that exists within debating um, has always been the same. I mean, obviously, like back in the days, it wasn't exactly like that. But like, uh, let's say, uh, starting 2012, maybe 2010s, and then going through today, has it evolved for the worse? Or have it, uh, has it always been a constant kind of like what, what a reflection of maybe what is happening in Western universities? That's an interesting question. Actually, I think so. I think debating is definitely a liberal bubble. I think it might actually be slightly less liberal a bubble now than it was just a couple of years back. I mean, it's weird because when I first started university debating, I rapidly became a lot more left wing, right? My, my political positions became a lot more left wing just from the people I was meeting, the arguments I was making. And then I ended up meeting some of like the actual crazy left wing types. And then I was like, Jesus, what the fuck is wrong with these people, right? <laughs> like, um, no, I think debating has always been in liberal bubble. I mean, certainly when I started debating in, well, like, 2012, it was already a very liberal bubble. 
I think around about that time, it was already considered pretty unacceptable to set a world's finals motion, like this house would ban abortion at all stages of pregnancy. And I think certainly there were multiple points where I think um, speakers who wanted to speak at the Cambridge Union were either not allowed to speak or had large protests against them precisely because of the fact they were anti-abortion, right? Um, I mean, on this topic of abortion, actually, since we're talking about liberal bubbles, I think one thing which is a bit galling about the liberal bubble is like how crazily inconsistent people end up being in their beliefs, like in this mad rush to be consistent with every knee-jerk reactionary left-wing position out there. Like like lots of people, for instance, when we're discussing abortion, will say, you know, they agree with like Will Jones's argument in that final, right? Um, you know, the fetus is using my body, I have a right to murder it because this is self-defense, right? Um, now, I think the real reason we should allow for abortion is because it's utilitarian. I'm a utilitarian, right? I don't care how many people you kill as long as you maximize happiness. And I don't care if fetuses or human beings kill them, right? But, but they believe in that very libertarian self-defense argument, which is weird, right? Because in any other situation, you tell them, like, is it illegitimate to, like, tax a rich person and take their wealth to help a poor person? They'll be like, of course, it's, it's good to do that. But like, just on the issue of abortion, they become like raging libertarians who are like, I will murder you if you dare to use my body, right? Like, and, and I remember similarly, I think not long after I, I retired my last worlds, somebody set in motion, I think in the US, about how um, whether it's legitimate for the Palestinians to basically carry out terrorist attacks on Israel, right? which is such a standard motion, it's actually boring, right? It's just how, it's just this house believes that terrorism is justified sometimes, but in the case of Israel. And then there's this huge brouhaha about it. Like, people are like, oh my God, you know, when I was debating on, on PM, like, I had to think of my Israeli friends and, and I was arguing that they should die. And I'm like, fucking hell, we just had a topic where you argue for global Marxist revolution, in which case literally all of your friends and yourself would, would be dead, right? And you are getting all like sensitive um, and, and, you know, getting like being such a snowflake about one classic terrorism debate. Um, so I do remember like ever since I started debating and immediately after, I was constantly annoyed at how lame people were being and close minded. Um, yeah, a as you can tell, I have a lot of like reactionary right wing in instincts. It's just that. I, I don't allow them to override what I do believe is ultimately the correct political position, which is to be left-wing. I think uh, what I will say about this whole thing, I think it's much more about human psychology than a lot of intellectuals would like uh, to say. Yeah, it's, 100%. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, to, 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 to explain that, because I think that you already got what I'm saying, but to explain that to people, what I mean is that um, in many cases, uh, you are predisposed to believe something because maybe it's uh, socially more acceptable or it's something in your gut feeling. So you're uh, likely to be persuaded by, uh, by arguments that in a vacuum don't necessarily make that much of a sense or are not as logically sane as others. But because you're predisposed to believe the end result of that idea, you're like, oh, yeah, that's also a great argument against abortion. Uh, and so that's kind of the problem, because uh, then it becomes a huge problem of uh, the things that we're actually saying, uh, uh, much rather about, like, internally what is the discussion. Because obviously, like, you, you, and, you, you can be left-winning, another person can be left-winning as well, but there is a spectrum to that. And so that spectrum is important when we're talking particular policy, how it affects different people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, since you, you kind of, now that you mentioned this, it's kind of got me thinking a bit. And like, do you know one of the strangest things which has definitely happened to debating, in many respects, it's a positive thing, actually, um, since when I started debating until now, um, is that white men, and by which I mean, like, men from Iona and the American circuit, and I, to a lesser degree, Australia, like, white men have just really let themselves go, have just really let themselves down as debaters, right? It's a weird thing. Like, you remember, like, when I was 
starting to debate, there were lots of like white male debaters who were like really great and had personalities, you know, like Will Jones, JLM, Steve Hine, Chris Croak, all these folks, right? This is kind of a, obviously a crazily, you know, speculative hypothesis, but like, why is it that none of them dare to be interesting or dare to have actual personalities or, you know, dare to tell someone who's making a dumb argument to just sh sit down and shut up anymore? Like, I feel like white men don't dare to do this anymore. Whereas, like, if you go to Eastern Europe, if you go to the Asian circuit especially, like, people are way more open-minded and have way more interesting personalities than, like, white people, but white men in particular. Is there not this weird thing going on? Am I just hallucinating this? Where have all the white men gone? Why are they all so boring all of a sudden? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's <laughs> that's quite the question that you get there. I think, uh, yeah, it, it could be like, I mean, you're giving a very uh, narrow interpretation of it, I have to say, but uh, the gist of what you're saying, I think it's kind of important, which is uh, uh, people think too much about certain identities and how do they fit in yeah. the paradigm of identities. And because of that, maybe uh, they're less restrictive. And I think uh, if you wanna, if I was gonna make this argument in a debate around, around yeah. to be persuasive, and I kind of believe that, I would say that this is, this is kind of uh, problematic on its own, even if you take it from the perspective of like, uh, white men have said enough because uh, white men will always have particular ideas, particular concepts, whatever, uh, uh, representing their identity. And if they speak less, they're not going to act less. They're not going to have less impact into our whole society. They're just going to uh, be less vocal about the things that they particularly support. Uh, yeah, it's is problematic. And I, I just think it's, I mean, Honestly, like, this is probably something we should celebrate, right? The fact that all the best and most interesting debating has really shifted away from where it traditionally used to be happening, or at least the way I see it. I mean, judging at Madrid, I certainly got the impression, right? Um, all the teams I wanted to do well were not teams from like, the traditional institutions because they were just so much more interesting to listen to. And, and I was just kind of thinking, like, why is it that not only... It, it's not just that, like speakers from Asia, Eastern Europe, or Africa have gotten so much better, right? I mean, it's obvious that they've, like, improved massively, right? But it's also that, like, the traditional institutions have just gotten a lot worse. And I just don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I think um, what I will say is I'm not going to get too much into this, but uh, I think some of these, like, big institutions from the past of work Cambridge and Oxford, uh, with the unions, etc. They, they. This is my take. Obviously, I'm not an insider. Mm. I will. I probably they'll never allow me in one of these institutions anyway. But what I will say is, um, I think the inner politics of uh, things that are outside of debating are kind oh. of mushed in yeah. with uh, what is actually about, and uh, this is kind of uh, stifle their progress. And uh, you know what, like. I, I think they're very talented debaters uh, from these institutions, but uh, as it is currently, they're not the best. And mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, they should be thinking about that. Why are we not the best uh, if we are uh, having... Uh, I think they definitely have the best resources in terms of very smart people who are, have their way with words and things like that. So they yeah. should be winning much more than they are. I'm sure of that. So maybe they should be thinking more internally of what has happened. I personally am not going to say the person, but I know like a, um, a close friend of mine who was an extremely talented debater. And uh, then he got into uh, one of these institutions. I'm not going to say the name, but basically an Ox Oxbridge institution. Uh, and uh, he was uh, kind of uh, basically heavily turned off by how it was internally structured and uh, um, they basically lost i think a very great resource that they could have had of like a very mm. talented uh, esl debater that uh, in a in a different alternative universe could have been uh, one of their like generation pushes 
uh, one of their great debaters, but it is what it is. I don't know how to fix it. Apart from telling them that uh, it's not okay to judge so much about competitions that inherently suck in terms of what is their <laughs> competition value. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. I, I stand I stand by that uh, that sentiment. I don't think people would disagree with you, to be honest. I think everyone kind of knows it's an open secret, you know. Uh, it's an open secret, but uh, it seems like it, it's um, so. What you were you aware of, like Roman's doom threat uh, against like uh, Oxbridge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it. I I loved it. It was great. I, I'm sure. I'm sure it's not the first one, but I do kind of feel like uh, I don't want to call directly people out, but I do feel like uh, some influential debaters uh, have not talked about this enough. Because of uh, I don't know what are the reasons, but uh, I think uh, from that perspective, there has to be some type of balance, right? Like uh, um, you you can be having these particular competitions, and uh, uh, they're entirely reliant on the fact that people believe that they're important. They are like uh, this is a reference to what I previously said, which is like uh, winning the Cambridge or Oxford Ivy is not gonna get you a nice job or whatever the fuck you want to do with your life. <laughs> so like uh, let's let's be let's be real here like they have to actually propose uh, something good as an experience yeah. and i think they do yeah. to a certain extent like speaking at oxford union cambridge union it's uh, it's great experience but uh, there needs to no, be no it's the surrounding things it's the cost of reg it's the awful crash you know it's the terrible walking distances it's a lack of time for prep yeah Yep, pretty much, pretty much. I think I think uh, Roman uh, Roman kind of uh, uh, said it all, but I, I mean there there are some I don't know there there was a response from one of these institutions. We'll see we'll see what happens and how these things are going to be uh, affected. So uh, I guess let's uh, I mean honestly I can spend like uh, this this whole conversation on this topic on its own uh, to 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 be fair, but. Uh, I think uh, if I had to sum it up, it's um, we need to uh, look past identities uh, for a moment and think about uh, what we are saying, why are we saying it. And we should have fun with what we are doing. I've, I've had fun uh, during Worlds. Uh, I've uh, uh, said things such as uh, we can fuck right here on this table in the top room of Worlds. And uh, this is always a memory that I will have. Uh, nobody can take it away from me. Yeah, um, I, and I think it's important to have fun with the game. And while you're having fun, you find yourself do much, much better. Um, so, so I think that the the the, the, the interesting segue to this is uh, I I wanted to to talk about it a little bit later, but uh, <laughs> when is the better time? Um, tell me a little bit more about uh, how would you compare. Uh, let's say, uh, older generations of debaters to debaters right now, which are some things that kind of make you go, uh, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing these things uh, since you were at the most kind recent like... worlds? So do you know what was funny about the most recent worlds? I thought it was very similar to the way debating was when I left in 2015. The main thing which surprised me was that very, very little had changed. Um, people did some random annoying things, like, like I think I mentioned, right? Like, count down to their speeches. Like, what the hell, man? People going, three, two, one, I'm going to stop. I'm like, what are you doing? Shut up. Just talk. Um, okay, I guess one thing, I mean, maybe two things which were a bit... No, three things which are a bit weird to me, right? Um... None of these are actually big things. The first is that people were much more willing to like throw in one or two really dumb arguments in with a bunch of really good arguments which they were making. Like I'll be going along, I'll be like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. It's rigorous, good examples, reasonably framed. And then totally insane claim will drop. And I'm like, what? And then it'll continue. Like, like that, that wasn't said. Like, for instance, I think there was one, one round on, what, is it in Taiwan's interest to pursue better relationships with China? Something like uh, that? Yeah, that was around seven. Yeah. 
The, the infamous and, and, um, mighty speak by Rowan. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I that, always remember that. See, that, that's one thing which I liked. That in this world, people were giving out like the kind of speaks which I was used to both giving and getting, right? Back in the day. Like 90s were being given out. I'm like, yeah, they should because 90s should be given every world. But anyway, so I think Ateneo was an opening up and they delivered like very solid bunch of speeches, right? They're generally very, very good, very solid speeches. Uh, speakers but one of the arguments they made was that like if taiwan like i think it was an opening up that taiwan should not pursue closure relations with china because it might end up with them becoming invaded by the u.s <laughs> and i was just like i i i you should i'm quite empathetic to the arguments which people make i can always understand from whence the argument came, if, if not the logic, at least what the motivating reason for it is. But like this argument, I was just like, what the hell is going on? This is this is not a thing. Why would the US invade Taiwan if it's like supposed to be an ally or something, right? Like, so so people tended to do that. And I, I single them out because they won the tournament. So it's no damage to them if I point out they did one dumb thing in one in round. Um, the other thing people did, like a lot of the whips will just say, in my whip, I will do three things. I will show you we beat OG, then I'll show you we beat OO, and I'll show you we beat CG. And none of these speeches were good. All of them were crap. I mean, crap by my standards means you might still get like an 83 or an 84. But like, they were clearly much worse than they would have been if they just talked about the issues because they just end up repeating themselves in a weird way or just like knocking a point which was dead at the moment of arrival. People used to do that. The last thing which people did, and this is not really a problem, but sometimes it did go overboard, was like, people just frame too much, man. Like, you do not need to tell me why stopping genocide is the most important thing in the debate. It's fucking genocide. Like, I get it, okay? You know, like, how JLM in that semi-final about whether or not um, they, the US should subsidize Twitter to liberalize oppressed societies, and like, the opening up team, actually really good, like, point out this is anti-competitive because you're subsidizing Twitter. JLM is like, yeah, damn straight, it's anti-competitive. It's also anti-competitive against evil regimes. I don't care. I want to stop war crimes. And, like, people should do more of that kind of framing and less of it. Here are five mechanisms as to why our point is the most important one in the debate. Because let's be honest, your five mechanisms will, will barely change, like, a reasonable judge's mind. Um, if your point was not already, you know, if the point was really badly made, the framing isn't going to work. And if the point was well made, I kind of get the impact without you needing to do, like, another two minutes of framing right um but honestly these are very small complaints like i had a good time at madrid i enjoyed the debates i watched um yeah I, and and it just surprised me how little had changed yeah well i think what uh, i'm getting from you uh, is that a lot of the things that you're pointing out are connected to style uh in debating which i think uh you are one of the best ever at. Um, and I, this is an important conversation for me because uh, like, uh, I think there, there, there's different ways to have a good style. Like obviously I cannot deliver a speech like you for uh, structure or design. No, but you say. have amazing style, Nikki. Uh, I mean, okay, come on, Let, let's be honest. Right? Let's be honest, right? You and your partner, right? Sophia, right? You cannot tell me that in the outruns of Madrid worlds, the fact that you're an ESL team was a disadvantage, okay? It was a massive advantage, right? And you guys tot do style like, well, the, I mean, we're the best stylistic speakers in the tournament by a long margin, right? In fact, in general, I think for quite some time, ESL speakers have been stronger stylistically than non-ESL speakers, genuinely, right? Like, think about Helena Ivanov, right, whose speech in that Euros final, I think the first 30 seconds, like, make my hair stand up, right? Or, or Stefan, who is so laconic and cynical and cutting, like, you know, and so laid back about it. Like, ESL speakers have amazing style, right? Or, I mean, it, and this is not new. Like, Yoni, right, in that Euro semi-final, I, I told him this, I would have given his speech like a 93, right? Because if I was sitting in that room, I would have fallen off my seat laughing, Right? So I, I'm sorry, I mean, I interrupted your question, but I just wanted to point out, since you mentioned that you don't do style like I do, like, yeah, obviously, but, like, the fact that your ESL actually gives you many stylistic opportunities, I feel that, like, I just cannot do, right? Like, you come across as much more authentic, 
right? You come across as much more, let's cut the bullshit, right? The thing about being too good at English is that you start sounding like you're trying to bullshit everyone at some point. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that particular point is uh, absolutely great to make. What I will say is uh, you're absolutely right. I, I, I've never felt a disadvantage. I think it's just uh, different styles within actually having a style. And I think that's particularly great about it. Like one of the uh, great examples that they had was like the debate that uh, you spoke with Yoni at, uh, at uh, Madrid this year. Yeah. It was the, it was the, the first yeah. day, I think. And was like, yes, please listen to this. This is how it should be done. Two stylistic speakers that have absolutely different, like uh, uh, how do I say, feels to them, but uh, they they grab you in. And this is what I've always uh, kind of tried to do. I think that the ESL part of the style, especially the one that I enjoy with, is exactly like this uh, thing where. I cannot play so much with the words, but I can play with the fact that uh, uh, some of these things, like for example, sound more funny. Like uh, I, I always will remember. Um, I, I think I already mentioned this on the podcast, but like uh, um, explaining uh, very uh, complicated stuff in a very yes a way that is very it's uh, it's 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 very funny, at, uh, but it's also like very powerful in the sense that it really. Uh, cuts out all the bullshit. Like I remember uh, talking about artificial islands and just saying, uh, these guys come in here, they put the sand in the ocean and now <laughs> they put the guns here <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's obviously like uh, not the, the most uh, intricate interpretation about exactly what was yeah. the artificial yeah. islands. But if you get to the gist of it, it is exactly that. And sometimes yeah. this is important to point out certain like uh, um, you know weird analysis on these things this is exactly how it works so because of that there are some problems or good things with it regardless of that and yeah that's uh, that's uh, that's definitely my way of doing it and i think with style and this is kind of like the question that i was getting to ask you uh, you can tell me um how you approach your style but for me it's always been about so Obviously, behind the, uh, the, 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 those distinctions is strategy, speaking particular arguments, mechanization, blah, 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 all of this stuff. But I think many times it comes down to particular strong sentences that you use particular words, particular visualizations, stories that you tell. And I've always kind of looked at it uh, from my perspective as a particular challenge. So basically, Roman will stand up and say, a bunch of interesting stuff, uh, arguments, mechanism analysis, and then I'll sit there and think, okay, which is the best story that I can tell about all of these arguments? Which is the which is the story that will stick in Gigi's mind and they're gonna think about it? Because I've noticed, especially when people are deliberating, they create this version of the story in their head, and through that they explain the comparisons, the well, what is likely, what is more likely, and this is how I approach style, especially. So, what is your take on this? Actually, my kind of approach to style really changed over the course of um, my sort of debating in university. I think when I kind of started debating, so like twenty twelve, fuck, it's like a decade ago. The hell, um, like I think. I was much more angry and unfocused. So my style was just like lots of aggression and shouting at people. And and I really would try to build up to moments. Like if I had a particular sentence or a particular analogy, I would try and, you know, make, um, like build up to that, right? So it meant that I wasn't delivering terribly good speeches, but there will always be one or two lines I really like. Um, do you have any ex actual examples from this? Maybe like the Euros final in 2013, Right. Um, it was about whether or not we should have whether or not we should have a general knowledge test for people before they can vote. Right. And we were closing up and like my speech wasn't great, but there was one line in it I really liked, which is that some people believe abortion is a matter of morality, it's a matter of God. It's unclear to me why knowing more geopolitics, more access to Kant or God than anyone else, right? Like, so I think. Style was very much about trying to, you know, create these big moments, um, which people could kind of, kind of take away with them. I think my approach changed a lot. 
actually, um, especially in 2014-15. And I kind of viewed style as a way of setting the right tone for the arguments I wanted to make, right? So there will be some debates where I will turn around and tell Michael, I am going to be so boring in this speech. I'm going to be so boring and dull that there's no way we can lose because the judge will be like, they just said some trivially true things, right? So anytime I was on a debate where I thought our side had an intrinsic advantage because the motion wasn't quite balanced or the motion was very technical, I would be so boring because boring is what you want to be, right? There's no need to be stylistic. Um, but then if I thought we were on like a wild, wacky, principled motion or on the difficult side of motion, yeah, then you just like you pull out all the stops, you get angry, you know, you attack the other side, um, you bring out all your fancy phrases, all that stuff. So so I, I think actually it's, I'm not sure people have the general impression of me as, as a stylistic speaker, because when I think I was at my so-called best in like 2015, I was generally quite boring until I hit a motion which I thought needed us to be stylistic, then I got very stylistic, right? It's also because, by the way, like Michael is just naturally very stylistic as a partner, right? One of his greatest gifts is that if he goes against a stylistic speaker with a big ego, you kind of know what speakers I, I'm talking about, yeah? If Michael speaks like that, like hearing someone else with a big ego speak in a stylistic way really fucking gets something in Michael going. Like, really gets his predatory and saying, like, yeah, I want to destroy this person because, like, I want to see that smirk wipe off their face. He has that kind of attitude in him. So I never needed to be the stylistic speaker because <laughs> I'd just be, like, I'd just be sitting there watching this person speak and then thinking, you don't know what's coming for you when Michael speaks, man, because you are doing exactly what pisses him off. So I didn't have to do very much style. But so that's kind of how I do it. It's all about setting the right tone for the kind of arguments I want to make. Because, like, you know, if I'm making a principal argument or non-consequentialist argument, right, it's all about, it's really all at the root about appealing to people's intuitions in a structured way, right? Like, for, for a person to believe they have an intuition, they need to feel it. They need to be like, damn, like, this is actually kind of fucked up, right? Or like, wow, this is a really amazing thing. Um, and that's not a logical process. That is not, at the end of the day, a logical process. It is about making them, uh, like, a part of what it means to be human. Like, you want people to actually feel it, like, yeah, I believe you when I say this is what it means to be, like, alive and in the world, right? Um, so I guess that was kind of my approach with style in, in the end, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm excited that you explain it this way because this is exactly how we've approached as a team as well. So it, it is dependent on the round. Some uh, some rounds, like, uh, I think uh, th this is something that clicked for us, especially at the Euros Open final, where we see the motion and we start thinking about, okay, these are some aliens, blah, blah, stuff. Uh, so obviously the first things to, to think about uh, how uh, this uh, information is going to impact uh, people on the ground, blah, blah, blah. And then we kind of get kicked into next gear or we're like, no, fuck this bullshit. Let's, uh, this, this is just about like uh, life. It's uh, whether life is yes. worth living. That's and why the Euros final was so great to watch, by the way. I think, I think people will watch it and feel things. And I think you've probably heard from lots of people that people who watch it final actually felt things. I think that's really the highest level of debate. Um, when you transcend the, the game, you transcend the rules, right? And then people who listen to it discover things about themselves, right? Um, and all my favorite speeches are speeches which did that to me. That's a, that's a very good way of putting it, honestly. Transcending the game, exactly, and uh, uh, people finding some things in these speeches. I think uh, this can happen even with like a not so strong case or whatever, but uh, the word choice and how you go about it uh, is definitely good. And uh, I think there's different motions to set up these other motions, as you said, are um, more technical. I've always tried to do it in different uh, particular ways. And this is what I most enjoy about the game and why I do it. Because I think of it as a performance 
And I think of it as like getting to people. That's why I fucking hate online debating. But so. <laughs> yeah, I hate online debating. Like, oh God, it makes me, I mean, it's just so dead. You don't get to hang out with people. You don't get to shit talk debaters or debates you saw, you know? <laughs> like, and, and yeah, like the physicality of style is such a big thing as well, right? Like, like presence. Like some people have got like a fuck, huge fucking aura about them. Like, and I want to experience that, you know? Like if I'm looking at you, like, you know, spitting at a small screen like i don't know what's the joy in that write an essay or something so so one thing i'm gonna mention about this because i've always found it funny but roman i, I mean i'm not sure if he's talked about this but this is something that he genuinely believes i'm not sure how all the times it works but he would purposefully because he's a very tall guy and he's like a strong balkan dude he would purposely uh, stand in front of people and kind of get in their physical space in order yeah. to throw them off their game. And yeah. uh, I've always, I've always kind of enjoyed this. And uh, one thing I'm gonna say about this is that, uh, especially after doing, um, because like we kind of were brought up in uh, the online era of debating for better or for worse, it definitely gave us some opportunities in the start, but. Um, once we uh, got to do our first major in person, which was uh, last year's Euros, it was totally different. And we could not, like we, we didn't do that many uh, prep competitions, but the ones that we did online, we could not bring ourselves enough to care. Yes, like, yes, ah, yes. This? It just feels so, it just feels like a chore, right? Yes, and we were genuinely worried. This is definitely a problem that Roman had as well. Uh, that uh, I don't know, we've gotten lazy, and we were like, Did we get lazy? What the fuck? We are not caring enough, we're not giving uh, enough passion with the speeches. And once we got to worlds in person, we we're like, uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I remember like this is another example that I want to give uh, around one of worlds. So people have been mostly doing online prep comps. So I go to them and I say, you have to start this page with a bang. Everybody, uh, everybody is not in the mood. They are like uh, uh, in a new place. They are kind of uh, feeling each other out. Uh, uh, they haven't seen my speeches. And he was PM of the first round. Uh, the first speech uh, that like many of the judges will hear for the tournaments. So I was like, you're going to stand up and you're going to bang on the table very, very hard. And you're saying, let's start this with a bang so that you, you <laughs> grab their attention. And then you go on and move on with the speech. And he did that. And like everybody in the room laughed. And it was uh, very, very fun. <laughs> to, yeah. Because so, you yeah. got to get like the right atmosphere, right? Like the best yeah. debates, it's not just the argument. It's the whole vibe of the room, right? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And there's none of that with online debating. I mean, actually, now that you mentioned, since you mentioned Ruman did a PM, this is one thing I think people definitely do less well now than they used to in the past. PM speeches. <laughs> like, you know, in, in the, in the, like, I always thought, and I still think PM is like the most broken role. Like, eight minutes? All the framing and arguments, you get to choose all the best arguments because no one has spoken yet. Like, how can you lose from PM? I mean, unless it's an insane topic. But, like, how can you not win from PM? Now everyone's terrified of PM, I feel. Um, and, and I just never got that. Like, look, of the three speeches, I don't know. I can't actually remember. I think, I think I've only ever gotten in 93 times, but two of those were for PMs, right? And I'm like, PMs are great. But people don't, don't really like them anymore. I don't know why. So this is an interesting topic that I want to expand on. Um... So obviously, like, and this is the reason why I speak second. For me, I get much better after, like, I've seen spe people speak and I could kind of um, tear apart their whole logic, uh, the way that they yeah. present arguments and things like that. So yeah. this is, like, I, I would be a terrible PM. This is why I never PM. I haven't PM in quite some time. Uh, but I, I guess this is, like, the... This is why I think, like, for me... I mean, I would say that I am up there with at least currently one of the best DLOs in, in the world because I'm really good at kind of picking apart and making fun of how particular arguments are presented from other teams. And I think DLO is specifically great for that because uh, you've seen how uh, like uh, 
what they say, how we respond to it, then how they respond to it. And now you're in this best position because you're top half. You probably have the most intuitive arguments already. So it's picking apart these particular um, intuitions. But yeah, this is why I've struggled with PM and maybe this is what uh, mm. other speakers have. I think uh, maybe it's connected a little bit to, to with confidence again. But uh, what, what do you think is misunderstood about the PM? And I think, OG. Yeah. I think what's really misunderstood, I think, I mean, there's a couple of things that I don't think people recognize about PMs enough. Number one, PMs are much more about style than any other speaker because you have to be remembered at the end of the debate. And also, literally, the first 15 seconds of your speech right, is going to define the whole tone for the whole debate, right? Like, if you use a particular example or illustration or argument and everyone else keeps talking about it, like, usually as a PM, you've kind of ended up winning the debate already, right? So I think that's the sort of the style element of it people kind of misunderstand. Second thing, people are really afraid of just making basic arguments well. Like, you know, I was, because because I did world schools, right? I was always taught, there are these standard arguments everyone knows how to make like a per in a perfect way, you don't even need to think. For instance, why is fiscal austerity bad, right? And in fact, that was relevant to one of the the out rounds, right, at Madrid. Like I thought that in the out rounds, everyone would know this argument, and so the first person, like in the PM, would just make this argument perfectly. But no one did, or at least the people who did it seemed embarrassed that this was a basic argument. Like, the reason it's a basic argument is because it's a great argument. It's incredibly hard to rebut. So just talk about it, right? Don't don't try and be too clever. Um, and I guess the third thing about PM is actually it's a personality thing, right? So that's why I kind of, I kind of totally understand where you're coming from. Um, and I think Michael might say the same thing too. Um, it's like, I mean, if I can kind of use an analogy for mathematics, right? There are two kinds of great mathematical thinkers. There are people who are problem solvers, and then there are people who are like system builders, right? So a problem solver looks at one specific thing and says, how do I solve this problem? And like they go really deep into it, right? A system builder looks at a mathematical problem and says, I'm not interested in getting the answer. I want to develop a theory un in light of which the answer to this problem becomes trivial, right? Instead of climbing down a mountain and going to another mountain peak, I want to like raise the water level so I can like take a straight line from one to another. And I think like PMs are really much more system builders than problem solvers, right? PMs aren't tinkerers. They, they, they like, they want to like create a whole world, right? Like this is the universe. This is the logic. Now deal with it, which is why I think the worst position actually in debating, especially if the PM is competent, is like leader of op. Cause you're like, it's eight minutes of like framing and characterization and rhetoric. And now I got to do both rebuttal and build my case. Um, and I think people need to recognize that PM has this system builder perspective, which is why a really good PM often sounds a bit like a whip, right? Because like a whip has seen all the arguments, already knows what's going on, and a whip is saying, all right, guys, we know what this debate's about. This is why we win. A PM should do that as well. A PM I, doesn't have to say this, but a PM should have a sense of, let's be honest, guys, we all know this debate is eventually going to come down to this issue versus this issue, or this group versus this other group. So let's just talk about it. Right? And I'll do all the intermediate stuff just to show that I know my arguments. But really, we know what it's all about. It's about these two big ideas and this big idea wins. Right? And I think people need to do more of that. Well, yeah, I think uh, this is uh, exactly the opposite of how most people approach PMs nowadays, which I think the general approach to it is I'm going to stand up and I'm going to uh, give as many arguments as possible. Uh, yeah. uh, say as many things as possible, essentially matter them uh, uh, everything that uh, they have on the table and um, not really, and, and I think this is coming back to style, I think this is important. So many times what I've used style for in particular, I mean this is from the whip perspective but since we're making the comparison, I would pick a particular metric of how to adjudicate the debate and realize that I need to convince the judge that this is the, the, the right metric to, uh, ah. to kind of win the debate on, which I think 
if you if you're making that comparison, I think it's a very smart comparison to make between whips and uh, PM uh, speeches. It's exactly the same thing. So obviously, there's going to be a lot of things that can be said in this particular debate. But you need to, I mean, you can call this framing or whatever. I don't care how you call it. But it is set them around in terms of this debate comes down to this and this. And if we win this, we're going to win the debate. But you need to actually do the work behind this. You can't just say it. You have to illustrate and uh, give the reasons as to why does the debate really give, uh, uh, does come down to this. And the way that many ESL speakers have done it is exactly through frame, to saying what this debate is not about and what is it about, essentially setting up the debate in a way that after that framing, it comes down to, yes, answering this particular question. And now we have all of the arguments uh, doing that. Because if you let it spread around in multiple directions, mm -hmm. oh boy, the, the, the Soviet was, teams yeah. or the other teams are coming for you, uh, talking only about that one thing and doing what, that particular thing. But you should be doing that in uh, OG, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, but the fun, you know, but the nice thing about PM, since you mentioned, you know, framing as being important to PM, it's like, I think in PM, rhetoric is especially useful as framing, right? Like, I mean, a debate I have in mind is, I can't remember, maybe this was a world's quarterfinal or something. It was about whether or not we would ban racial surgery. And Sheng Wu is an LO. And he doesn't begin by saying this debate is really about libertarianism and limits on government you know, intrusion into people's personal lives. He begins by telling a story about how, like, he doesn't feel Chinese, but the Singapore government sees him as Chinese and so forces him to learn the Chinese language. And then he says, you know, what the prop really want to do is they want that they want to lock you into the color of your skin. They want to tell you that you just are the color of your skin, right? And, like, he's not doing framing, but, like, the first time I heard the debate, at least, I listened to the PM and I was like, this is so solid and well-explained and meticulous. Then when Shenglu stood up to speak, I was like, oh, right. There's like this whole other universe out there, right? And instead of it being what like this little fiddly thing called making marginal differences to how races are perceived, this is about the government dictating what your body means to you. I'm like, shit, that's such a big, like, there's a sudden shift in perspective, right? And I think, look, obviously, a PM can't react to someone. But, like, I think sometimes the rhetoric of a PM also does that, and you don't even realize it's framing, which is the beautiful thing about it. I, I, I actually love how you put it, and I'm going to use your own words, uh, because this is something that I just thought about. So maybe it is the fact, maybe I should be start, starting to do more PMs, uh, but that's another question, but... Yay. I think I think it's exactly connected to what you say in terms of setting the tone. So usually the panel and the judges, when they go into the round, they will actively, uh, subconsciously and uh, uh, consciously try to uh, stay neutral, to not have certain um, dispositions uh, about uh, or intuitions about the round. But if you get to break that barrier first, that's a really powerful tool because then they can grab on to something convincing and a feeling, if you, if you can say, and it's hard to pull them away. It's hard to win them over, uh, or uh, especially because this is like the first uh, uh, kind of um, um, emotional connection that they will have with a particular argument. It's, and it's, hard it's also... To, it's, it, uh, it's also because if you think about it, what is not logically established can't be logically rebutted. I mean, it's not always true, but if you think about it, right? People think, ah, that was just framing, that was just rhetoric. I can logically rebut it. But no, logic is not the way to kill these kinds of points, right? Like, you need the rhetoric, the imagery, the, the emotion to kill those kinds of points. Because if they're not based entirely on logic, then logic wouldn't do the job. Yeah, I think uh, now that we talk about it, like uh, we've had a bunch of people uh, I've talked with, like say, or maybe both say always underrated, the, uh, blah, blah. And maybe there are some points to that, but uh, one thing that he does very well in that final is exactly what we're talking about. Right yes, now. exactly, yeah. And, and people remember this speech to this day, and maybe like obviously now that we have uh, 
the benefit of uh, seeing the future. We can sit down, me and you, and uh, make a really good uh, um, breakdown of why this argument is bad or is not uh, yeah. the most logically sound. But, but that's uh, not the point, right? That's not yeah. what you should take away from watching that speech. If what you're thinking of when you're watching speech is, well, I don't think he had enough layers. I don't think it was framed clear enough. I'm like, go get a life. You know, go be an actual human being sometime. <laughs> but, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, which are some of your um, like uh, favorite rounds? Maybe not only connected to style, but just in general. Uh, one of our um, listeners, uh, viewers, whatever, uh, said to ask you about round nine of 2014 Worlds, where um, apparently... Um, you have a very good case. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that or other kind of highlights of your debate career that you think of. Round 9 of 2014 Worlds. I don't know what happened in Round 9 of 2014 Worlds. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, let me let me look this up. WDC 2014 Round 9. If I see the motion, I'll remember what happened. Um, oh, regrets the commodification of indigenous cultures. Okay, 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 okay. All right, I know why people are asking about this. So, um, no, because at this point in the tournament, um, Chris Bissa and L Jones had won every single in round. Right, so they were coming to the last round on twenty four out of twenty four. Right, in the last round, they were closing opposition. We were opening gov, and I think Tom and I we gave a pair of nineties and won that that room. Um, and it was about commodification of indigenous cultures. That PM speech, which I gave, if you actually listened to it today or just read a transcript of it, it would not be terribly interesting. It was just super solid and meticulous, right? And, and lots of comparisons about why culture, um, you know, why the way in which culture is commodified strips it of context, strips it of meaning, stri strips it of life and vigor to the people to whom it matters the most. And in any case, what they really need is not for the culture to be represented, they need fucking jobs and urban centers, right? That's what people need. Um, so it wouldn't have been a terribly interesting transcript to watch, but I can tell you the vibe of that room was like freaking awesome, right? Like, And if so if you win from OG in a room where the vibe is great, you are probably going to get at least a pair of 88s, right? This is always, this is like one of the eternal rules of debating if people apply the scale sensibly, right? Um, so honestly, I can't remember in detail what we said. <laughs> I remember it was the only round in the whole tournament where Tom had two sheets of paper as opposed to one. Because Tom Simpson only ever debates of one sheet of paper and he writes almost nothing down. So I remember it was the only debate where he was like, right, we're finally in the top room, we got to do this, and he used two sheets of paper. So and I, so I think similarly for one of the earlier rounds, I think it might have been round three where we also got a pair of 90s from JLM. It was about whether or not we regret hookup culture. And again, the vibe was amazing. And again, my speech was just um, a bit of rhetoric at the beginning uh, about dehumanization and seeing women as objects. But a lot of the speech was just very careful. And I remember that particular speech around three, I just sounded so reasonable, right? I was like, look, I'm not saying that um, hookup culture leads to rape, but it certainly shifts the whole spectrum of possible interactions with women in a very dangerous direction. So on the extreme end of the spectrum, you might get Rohit Nol spits into someone's string. On the less extreme end, you get blah, 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 right? So I remember I sat down and being like, you know, if I listen to that, I'm not sure what my rebuttal would be. <laughs> and evidently, other people didn't know what the rebuttal was either. So that was nice. It's actually funny that you say about the vibe of the room. I think... Um... Uh, the, the round seven of us that we get 1989 was uh, very similar to exactly what you're saying. Like, especially after uh, I've heard all the speeches, I was like, oh, that's a good point. Oh, that's very powerful to say things like that. So like the whole vibe of the room was uh, like uh, very, very intense. And I was like, oh, maybe we are third, maybe we are fourth. Uh, this is quite a good room. Uh, and it, it's probably is uh, the reasons why uh, uh, we, we receive such... Uh, uh, high scores um, and I guess that's uh, that's kind of important like uh, you need to think about uh, all of these things uh, and I've always um, um, I've always liked when I have like a top half for example which is very not vibey 
let's say like that. Yeah. And then I come on and I can uh, play with the vibe and I can see. Yeah, like, yeah. All those of you who are sleeping in the audience, the debate starts now so you can start paying attention. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. I think, uh, I, I think uh, the changing the vibe is uh, very, very powerful. And so I, I genuinely think it's one of the reasons why we have been doing so well. Um, in, in the recent years is uh, that so we've been in many debates where we kind of just change the vibe of the room once we stand up, uh, even if we're not like having the best case and things like that. Uh, so it it's, uh, it's brings down uh, the attention. Um, so what are some uh, bitter moments of your debate career? Uh, bitter I mean, moments... Ah, well, so obviously, I think 2015, not making it past the quarters, we've been quite bitter, of course. So I was like very mm -hmm. like upset about that. Um, but I know it happens. And I think it's very hard to remain bitter about it so long after the fact, right? You know, you just didn't have a good debate. It happens, right? Um, bitter. So I, and, and, but the thing is, the reason why I'm not bitter about those, um, about not making it past quarters, is also because I can kind of understand why people wouldn't put us through, right? Um, it's not an insane thing to have done, but things which are probably a bit more like generally a bit like annoying, right? So I think HWS in 2015, maybe? I can't remember. I am sure it's 2015 because this I have is been the in, question that I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, I was, I've, been in I, I've been in the final three times, right, of HWS. Actually, I've only ever broken top at HWS, which <laughs> if you think about it, it's insane because like, how did it happen, right? Um, and and the first time was undeserved, that objectively. Um, so I, I can't. Yeah, the second HWS final was something about civil rights leaders not taking. I don't know something about them not taking up political office or something like that. I remember just sitting. I was so we broke first, but we opted to be OG because, as I told you, PM is the best position to be in, right? Um, in that, I remember at the end of the debate, you know, people said stuff. Uh, I was thinking. Did anyone actually rebut the claims I made? I don't actually think, I think they all stand. I think all the three main thrusts of my argument stood. I mean, this is my recollection from eight years ago. I haven't actually watched that debate since. Um, you know, but then we ended up taking second to um, the Hard House team, which is a fantastic team as well, by the way. I'm, I'm objectively happy that they wanted the team to just one HWS. Just wish it didn't come our cost. So I had to come back the next year when I was in the middle of my national service and objectively quite rusty already and had not done any debating in like a whole year to do HWS again. <laughs> and then that, 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 that time we won, but like the call was a lot closer and objectively it should have been a lot closer. Um, I think, I think Ayal still maintains that they definitely won that round. And all I tell him is I haven't watched it. So I don't know. I only know at the end of the debate, I got a vibe that we might win. That was annoying. I think also similarly Oxford, Oxford IV. I think I've been in the finals three times and best speaker. Somehow we've never won. But okay, again, that one I'm, I'm okay with. Um, LSE, man. Dude, LSE. I did it with Shangwu in 2015. Like, we... Uh, the most enjoyable, mind-blowing debating I've done in my entire life, okay, was doing LSE with Shangwu. All right? I'm not saying that answer Tom Simpson, you know, or Michael were not amazing partners. Absolutely amazing partners. It's not like debating with Shangwu, okay? We did so well. We won all the in rounds, sailed through the out rounds, making some balls ass arguments. Um, and then in the final, we lost on, I think, a 3 2 1 split or a 4 3 2 split or something insane like that. And it's like, oh, damn it. You know? But so those are things, festivals are more annoying. Um, worlds, I'm not. I'm neither annoyed nor bitter about now, to be honest, because it's so long ago, um, and it's. It's. I mean, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life which I re find really fun. So I, I, you know, I don't dwell on this that much. No, for sure. I don't think that, uh, especially with debaters like you, that have had the time to kind of uh, gain a better perspective, you will be dwelling so much. But I think what. The, the little bits of frustration that are still, still left with you are absolutely normal. And I think they're fun to showcase because it shows that you love the game. It shows yeah. that you care about the game. 
And I think that's a, a, that's a great uh, message to spread around to debaters nowadays, as we've already yeah. um, discussed. So if you, if you had to do Worlds one more time, for some reason, uh, let's just... I still uh, have got one actual world slot left. Uh, you see? So uh, <laughs> it's which, uh, which debaters would you pick to speak with from throughout history and from maybe current debaters? So you've been at the last world, you've seen some of the current debaters. That's such a, that's a fucking amazing question. I have no idea. I mean, look, basically everyone, I think, either is a really good debater or even if not a great debater, just kind of fun to spend time with, I would pick, right? So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of Singaporeans I'd be happy to do it with. Um, I must say, you know, before Chin went to university, I did debate with him a couple of times, or maybe, maybe just twice, I can't remember. And I always found it very fun because he's he's very stylistic, so it's enjoyable to watch him debate. Um, and obviously lots of other Singaporean debaters. Stick away, obviously, I'd be quite happy to go with. Um, okay, maybe kind of going phonologically, right? So it's, I think people like Sam Block, um, Sheng, Will Jones, JLM, um, people who I think have a sense of um, fun to the way they do debating, right? Who, who make speeches I actually want to watch as a partner. Obviously, we have to do with any of them. Um, if I was to look at more... So, so called like speakers from this current era. Oh, this is a good one. I mean, I think yourself and Ruman, I definitely would have fun with. Again, it's because I would enjoy actually watching his speeches. Um, no Americans, they're all a bit boring. Um, been boring for a while, I must say. Um, I mean, Hadar and Tamar, I mean, absolutely no no issues there. Probably that's what comes to mind immediately. If you look at more recent generations, the things I don't really know about speakers in recent generations, you know, like Tin and so on and so forth, um, or, or, or this whole very, you know, illustrious lineage of Filipino um, debaters. I, I, you know, I don't watch debates for fun in my free time. Um, so I just haven't seen them enough. But yeah, that's probably it. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I, I'm generally quite okay debating. I, I found, you know, some people have very specific styles. You need to go with uh, speakers who compliment you. I find that I debate more or less okay with anyone for whatever reason. Um, yeah. I think the answer to that is coming from my perspective because I do think that uh, I'm also one of those speakers that you can put in very different situations with different mm -hmm. teams and very adaptable. And I think one of the reasons for obviously it's also about personality a little bit so some yeah. people are very like this i am more of a you know um i like to use the first speaker's ideas and build upon them rather than i mean obviously some rounds i'll have a really like uh, particular opinion so i'll be like this is how we should do it but uh, in a lot of these rounds i believe that it's better to let the first speaker uh, convince the judge of something that they uh, intuitively believe or intuitively think it's a good argument and then play with that as opposed to uh, kind of inserting myself too much within the case building process. Oh, I think that's one, of, yeah, that's one of the things, but maybe you are like that, you can say this, but I think the general thing is style. Stylistic mm. speakers fit anywhere. Uh, so, Actually, now, I mean, now that you mention it, there is one thing, right? Since you mentioned personalities, there's certainly one kind of debater I never want to debate with, and that's someone who doesn't enjoy it, right? And like, who fundamentally doesn't want to be there. And I said I saw a couple of them at Worlds. Like, if they're really stressy and really focused on the outcome and will never run a fun argument, even if it's, you know, because, oh, my certainly reduce your chances of winning, I will not debate with them, you know? I, I don't see a. I, it's not enjoyable. I don't see the point. Yeah, this is uh, this is a, <laughs> a huge blocker. I think uh, for anybody that enjoys the game and loves the game, it's a huge blocker because uh, if you get too uh, concerned about the outcomes, it's, you're probably even gonna do worse, which is gonna be like uh, uh, playing to the part of like I don't enjoy this, or if you lose. 
you can look back to the rounds that you had fun and it uh, kind of eases the pain, if I yeah. can say it like this. Yeah, exactly. So I think we mentioned a lot of names. Um, I have to get into the other segment of the show, which is um, the greatest debater of all time conversation. Oh, I, I heard about this. I heard you asking yeah. everyone who comes on the show, right? For sure, for sure. So um, how do you approach this conversation? And obviously, what's your answer? Well, I mean, for me, it's not even close. It's obviously Sheng Wu. Um, all these people nowadays who think they are smart, you know, who think they're stylistic, they don't know what these words mean. They really do not know what these words mean, right? Um, okay, if I have to break it down, right, okay, um, I'll take a couple of things. I think the first thing, at least for me, right, because, I mean, the GOAT is an, an aesthetic choice fundamentally, right? It's whose debating style speaks to who you are. Um, I think that the thing which really um, excites me about the way Shang Wu uh, debated was that his speeches always raise the overall intellectual standard and richness of a debate. It was never closing things down. It was always adding stuff and making stuff more deep, more interesting. Like it's part of a bigger conversation which is happening over time. Um, and, and, and the speakers who do the exact opposite, right? And who are very skilled at doing that. So the reason why I would never... I mean, there's a whole bunch of Monash debaters who became very good at winning debates by reducing them to like absolute zero. Right, like by just sucking all the intellectual interest out of them, right? And obviously, the, the best example of this—it's a very admirable example. It's a very good way to do debating, but to me, it's alien. It's like this house supports nationalism, right? And they define nationalism to mean, un, you know, unadulterated, unconditional love, respect, and support for every single person who lives within the geographical boundaries of the nation state. I mean, ingenious way to win. Because if you define it that way, you will win. But there's no intellectual interest in the debate, right? I mean, they could still have made many of the arguments without having that definition. But they chose to do it that way, right? Um, um, and, and so, like, the, the intellectual content of a debate goes down, right? Whereas Sheng Wu's speeches, he will not cite libertarian philosophers, he will not cite Kant or all these great thinkers, but it's very obvious, actually, where his ideas are coming from. Right? That's what I find so surprising. Like the intellectual lineage of his thoughts is always so clear. Um, like, ah, he's doing that Kant thing, or he's doing that that you know, that Nozick thing, or that Rawls thing. And it just excites me a lot because then suddenly a debate is not about like a bunch of college students, you know, jerking each other off. Um, it becomes about there are all these fantastic big ideas in history, right? Let's actually see how they work in this context. And I'm like, wow, this is exciting. This is educational. This is cool, right? That's the first thing. That's the thing I appreciate the most by far. And it's something which is by and by and large totally dead nowadays. Um, and it's not a generational thing. It's just that when Sheng Wu was around, he made it possible to debate that way for a while, and then it died out. Um, second thing is just style. Again, people say a lot of stuff about style, so on and so forth, right? Like if you can get audience reactions like he got in the Euro semi-final or his world quarters in the world semi-final, please let me know because I'd be very impressed. And I, and I don't think anyone um, is able to excite people in that way, right? And it's funny because the way he excites people is not by telling jokes, right? It's because he makes a certain argument so clearly and so devastatingly, it becomes funny. Like an argument can be so clear, it becomes funny. Like, again, the Euro semi-final, right? When he said, look, we thought this was a great idea to do in the Crusades, and arguably, we're still feeling the backlash. That's not a joke. That is an actual legit point. It's also fucking hilarious, right? Um, similarly, when he says, you know, the thing about doing something intentionally as opposed to accidentally is that it happens a lot more than if you did it accidentally. It's not a joke. It's a point, but it's also hilarious, right? I think it's really weird to see those two things come together. Sam Block can do that as well. Um, it's a very rare gift. Uh, and, and I can't do it. So to me, it's like some mag magic trick, right? Um, the third thing which I like about his style, and this is something which, again, I don't think people can do, is to become so logical and precise. It's the exact opposite of being stylistic. To become so logical and precise, um, the speech almost becomes like a mathematical proof. Um, it, it's almost like what they call like non-constructive proof 
proofs in, in mathematics, right? There's something slightly unsatisfying about them because all the logic is so clear, it must lead to a conclusion. But in a way, it's almost like too clear, right? And it's weird that he can win in both a very rhetorical style and in this way. I think the best example of how he wins in this way is like his HWS final or like his Euros final, right? By the way, he doesn't think very much of his Euros final. Um, because I think he much prefers doing the sort of rhetorical thing. But, like, I really like that, right? Um, because it's such a weird way to do debating, and it's very pleasing to see. There's something, again, slightly mysterious and magical about it, uh, to reach that kind of rigor. Um, so, I, and, and I don't think any other speaker in history comes close to having these three characteristics in equal proportion. And I don't think he had them all at the same time, right? I mean, the people who know him say that he developed the rhetoric and the style much later on, and he grafted that on top of what was already like a, a huge intelligence, right? So if I had to break it down, this is what I would say. But the other thing I would say is, um, I have debated with many, many people in my life, many people who are extremely smart, extremely successful, and all of whom have skills which... Um, I can't replicate. Um, but I have always felt that I could at least understand how they thought, right? Um, I could always feel that we were, in some sense, intellectual equals, right? Even if we had different intuitions. Like, Shung is the only person I've debated with, and I've thought, oh, okay, like, this really is, like, a genuinely different level. Like, this is a person whose intelligence is on a different level from any other person I've met in my life, okay? Um, and I, 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 that's not an exaggeration. The number of times when we were at LSE when he would suggest outrageous ideas, which would be totally 100% logical in hindsight. It was like every other debate. He would, like, every prep of Shengu was just, he would just look at me and go, you know the standard arguments, right? You just make those. What is really interesting, though, is if we could make this debate about justifying international piracy of the Horn of Africa. And I'd be like, what? Right, so this example comes from a date. So this house would um, criminalize the payment of ransom. Right? We were opening up. So I know all the standard arguments, moral luck, double punishment, people will do it anyway, you can't track the criminals, you need to give them the money, all that stuff. Shangu said, yeah, but you know, a lot of piracy, a lot of kidnapping happens when people stop these oil tankers off the coast of Somalia and hold the people on their ransom, right? Let's justify that. Let's say that is good and justified. And so our argument became, in part, you know, when the state uses its monopoly on violence to hold a ship at sea and say and demand money for safe passage through its waters, why is that any different from what international Somali pirates do? They don't really have a functioning state. A lot of that money eventually goes back to the communities which rely on it. And because these shipping companies have insurance, really the risk that they take, like any ordinary tax, become reduced to regular payments. Right? And we're like, if anything, it's immoral not to pay the Somali pirates the money. Right? Because you're a multi-billion dollar oil company, you should be giving these poor people with no functioning state money, right? And so like, that's the kind of direction his mind would move in. Like, like that, right? Or in round five of the in-rounds where it was about, I mean, it was about violence is a legitimate response to poverty. We were closing Gov, and so we ran just the usual non-consequentialist stuff, which I think now people are kind of familiar with, right? Um, and we kind of, and we spent like 10 out of our 15 minutes thinking about the perfect analogy to use and eventually came out with the Warsaw Ghetto. Which actually, someone pointed out to me, I didn't realize it's finally passingly mentioned in this world's final. So someone must have mentioned it to him at some point. Um, because the commander of the, well, the, not the commander, but the, the person who led in large parts the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto said the uprising was about choosing the time and place in which we were to die, right? And so we said, and I think I mentioned this in, some lecture I have online, but like Sheng Wu's argument was um, capitalism is violence and you are allowed to defend yourself against violence no matter what the consequence is. So who cares if the world burns as a result of this, right? And the way he proved it was that he walked up to Jack Watson. I think he grabbed Jack's wallet or phone or something. And he said, look, if I take this and I keep walking away from, from Jack, at some point, his phone is going to end up back in his hands. Do you know how it ends up in his hands? It's not because property rights magically assert themselves. It's because the state will send someone to knock me down and rip the phone out of my hands. Property rights are violence. 
They are not metaphorical violence. They are not structural violence. They are just violence. And if they are violence, I have a right to defend myself against it, right? <laughs> like, and, and he constantly, every debate was just like this over and over again, right? Without fail. Um, and look, you know, I think maybe sometimes I have these moments as well, right? And I'm very proud of them. But the fact that he was doing this in every single debate was genuinely mind-blowing. Like, um, yeah, so for me, no question. I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, I mean, there are lots of other candidates as well, including people I think don't unremembered as well as they should be. But I just want to make it very clear. There is like, as far as I'm concerned, it's objective, it's clear, it's not even close, it's shown. Um, I think this is the best answer that we've got so far. Uh, because of the way that you explained it, I'm going to break the fourth wall for a second and say that uh, this bit <laughs> that we've just had is exactly the reason why I'm doing this podcast. It makes me uh, like I, I have the, you know, my hair sort of, um, I, I genuinely enjoy these conversations and uh, I, I, I can never get that particular perspective and I'm very, very happy that uh, people like you are coming on the pod and we're having these conversations. I think, uh, like, honestly, this just made my day. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it out there. I don't no, have thanks, anything thanks. to add. I, I don't have anything to add. I think that uh, this is a great answer, um, and I'm and I'm happy that you uh, that you gave it. Uh, so maybe let's um, let's leave it at that and move on with us more spicier uh, question that they have for you. So this is a question uh, that I'm gonna read out. It's a question from some, uh, from our audience. Um, it's, uh, it opens up an interesting topic that obviously I have very interested in, but um, what was it like to have the wrong call on the world's final panel? Yeah, you. Uh, are you sure you didn't plant that one? Well, look, let, let me put it this way. I just happened to look at it. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, I spent most of Madrid, especially in the out rounds, giving wins to teams I didn't want to see winning. All right? Okay. And, and full disclosure, right? I had told multiple people who obviously kept it confidential during the course of the tournament because you have to be impartial as a judge, that... God damn it, I really hope the Pinoys don't win this. Not because I have anything against them, actually. I think they're really fantastic debaters, right? Um, it's just that, like, I want people who are kind of slow and stylistic and make very few points. I, you know, I'm just not terribly attracted to that. Let's throw out five different frames. Ooh, isn't that impressive? I'm like, you've got five different frames. It just means you don't know what the right one is. Because if you knew the right one was, you would just run that, right? <laughs> like, it's a very hedgy and very safe kind of debating they do. Right, where it's very hard to come worse than second, which is why they do so well, right? So objectively, they are phenomenal, phenomenal debaters. But I was telling everyone I knew, you know, who wouldn't like go around telling people that I really hope the Pinoys don't win because that's going to be so damn boring, right? And I said the two teams in the final, I, the two teams I really want to see in the final, and I'll be happy to do everything in my power to give either one of them the win. Your team and like Hadan Tamar, which, which institution were they, by the way? Was it Tel Aviv? No. Tel Aviv, yes. I, I don't remember institutions. Yeah, so it's like Sophia Tel Aviv. Like, they're the two teams I want to win. And, and I was joking with people. I was like, yeah, just, you know, just if I get in the final, like, I'm just going to make sure one of those two teams wins, right? And then sure enough, both of you get into the final. And then, like, I just can't. And the win goes to opening up because that, that super risk averse, throw out dozens of arguments, stuff like three la layers of rebuttal on the 20 seconds of a speech thing. I mean, it just ended up working in that debate, as it often does, right? In fact, um, when, when Tel Aviv gave the POI they gave to opening up, right? Because actually, for most of the opening half, I was unclear about whether or not you guys were ahead or opening up was ahead. I was very marginally leaning in favor of you guys. Then The more I thought about it, the more clearly I thought it was opening up. But that was just the opening half, right? And then when they gave that POI, which was like, can't people have multiple identities? You know what my first thought was? My first thought was like, I'm like 99% sure they're winning this debate. 
Because that one observation about people having different identities, if you think about it, destroys every single point on opening law. If you just think about it a tiny bit, right? And I actually thought it was insane. I, and then I was shocked that they had dared to give that as a POI to the opening law. Because why would you let them know you've got this simple winning point? You want to withhold that as a POI, right? Um, anyway, then, um, you know, Ateneo ended up, I think, in the, the second speech of the deputy, ended up doing like a, a quick 20 seconds worth of argument about how, oh, it's hard to have multiple identities. And I thought, okay, they said stuff, but it's very easy to rebut. You know, Tel Aviv is going to say, those are not good reasons. Here is why multiple identities wins the debate. And then they just didn't. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Similarly with you guys, right? Like I thought one like one of the most winning -y points you had was the whole people go away, they come back, they help the community, right? But like, so the, the two judges who gave it to you quite reasonably actually thought that this was a very big mechanism which applied to a large group of people in a large number of cases. I just thought because you didn't make it clear either through framing or rhetoric or whatever, I couldn't quite credit it to that extent. So again, like it was just very frustrating for me to judge that final because at the end of the, the round, I was like, I'm fairly clear opening up has it. Um, but I was like, God, God damn it, you know? I wish I didn't have to give it to them. But honestly, every time I judge at Walls, I just end up knocking out most of my favorite teams. Like I, I put out um, the Bangladeshis as well, the year I judged them. I also ended up knocking out, um, well, not knocking out, but like, judging around where Ayal and um, Dan, you know, got kicked out in, in Thailand. Um, and these are teams I honestly root for so bloody hard. <laughs> like, well, I mean, what can I do, right? Like, the, the stupid game has these stupid rules. And because the stupid rules are not identical with my preferences about how, <laughs> like, what style should do well, I follow them. But yeah. I mean, objectively, I'm actually very happy that with the way the final turned out. And I think the one team which no one thought had a chance of winning was the American team, right? And then, like, the two ESL teams and the Ateneo team ended up being the ones. I, it's such a nice place for debating to be in. Nothing against Americans, of course, right? It's just, it's, a, it's, it's super nice that debating has come to this point, I think. Yeah, I think um, me and Rowan were listening to the POIs from CO. I thought they were gonna win it because I was yeah like, good. So you they, had the same thought I had, yeah. Yeah, if they go in this direction, this is exactly the direction that we would have gone, which is like yeah. absolutely like just we have to be selfish. Fuck everybody else. Why the fuck do we owe anything else to do uh, to these people? Yeah, which right. I, the libertarian argument. Yeah, I've always like this is this is why I struggled with OG in this round, which is like for me this is the strongest case. And I'm really not sure how to beat it. And like half of the time I spent on thinking about how to prove things to actually beat that. And I was kind of caught off guard with like what actually Ateneo did in that particular round. But I would have loved to be CEO in that debate. Would yeah. Have loved to be. Yeah. So in I'm fact, confident we, that we would have. Yeah. I would have loved for OO to just have gone libertarianism, right? It's like, I'm sorry, societies don't own you, societies are formed by you. Like, fuck society. Right? Like, that would be the case I would have run an op because, like, that's the big argument. That's where this debate becomes interesting. This debate's about marginal things like, oh, you know, if you have a wrong identity, a society might be a bit mean to you. It's about, no, fuck society, right? Who gives you a right to claim my body, my identity, my language, my life, my obligations? Like, you know, that's all I would have gone with. But, you know. Yeah, we, uh, it's fair to say that. Uh... We didn't feel like we were on the right side of history on this one as compared to the... Yeah, it's kind of funny Minnesota that you guys final. were like in that position in the semi-final and then in also in... And then like, you know, you guys were OG in the semi-final, right? Uh, we were CG. CG, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's just funny that you guys had like swap ideologies like for your last two rounds. Uh, for sure. Um, I guess the little follow-up question to that is also I think you... We did went uh, quite uh, a bit into it. Um, what was the vibe in that uh, deliberation, in that panel? What were the things, what were some highlights of that particular discussion? Because I think this is something that 
not many people get to know about. Uh, like mm. the average debater won't get this particular story from you. Then let's say maybe I come to you after the finals and ask you what yeah, happens yeah. in the deliberation room. The the vibe was actually very uh, pleasant. Actually, it was very amicable discussion. I quite enjoyed it. I think initially we had three people thinking that you won, and I think I might be getting this wrong. But I think three people thought you you won. Or at least had a good chance, and I think one person thought that CG had a chance as well, and then the remaining of us were OO. Um, and so I think quite quickly we ended up um, agreeing that it basically was a top half discussion, um, and that that was like maybe 40 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes of discussion, um, because the 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 issue with the Athenaeum case was that they said lots of small mitigating things in response to a lot of your arguments, right? And so some judges, and I was one of those, thought that even if they say lots of small mitigating things, you need to push back a bit harder for your case to be fully persuasive. Whereas other judges were like, um, no, but like as you know, if the core logic of the point still stands, I credit it a lot because it seems very impactful to me. That's what it came down to. And I think one person then swapped over from um, OG to OO. And that was the only that was the only big change, really, the big change in that discussion. But it was super amicable. Like, we took, like, selfies at the end of it because we're all crammed into this tiny little space. Um, also, I find that, honestly, for certain kinds of discussions, and I think the final was one of those, if everyone has got good reasons for paying attention and no one is biased, because actually in some rounds, and I was shocked by this in Thailand World when I was CAing, Sometimes, like, judges just go full on for the team for the circuit. I was shocked by how blatant it is. Like, even when the team clearly is not through, they would just say, no, I want them to go through. Um, this was not like that. It was very, I mean, everyone made sense. Everyone was having a good time. Um, so we had a chat. We took two rounds of votes. And then it was eventually 7-2. So that's how it came down. How often does that happen? I find that when, yeah. Just to, I'm um, referring to what mm. you were talked about, like some biases the judges have for certain particular institutions. Ah. Because obviously, from the perspective of uh, debaters, especially who are very competitive, um, regardless of what is the truth, uh, it sometimes feel like uh, certain judges do have certain biases and just, you just have to essentially fight through those biases. So mm. how big of a problem really is it as compared to other structural reasons which i think are also valid as to why judges from particular circuits you uh, tend to give it uh, to the team from their own circuit so i would think the the case i just described where you really just are rooting for a team from your circuit i think i've only encountered that like you know having judged i would say maybe about a hundred hundred fifty ish rounds in my in my life um maybe about five or six. But of that five or six, three were at Thailand Worlds. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, and it was also judges from one particular circuit, um, whom I shouldn't name, probably. But people will know. I mean, people who are there will know what I'm talking about. Um, so I think that's a very small problem. It's not a big problem to worry about. Um, and also because, honestly, if you have a sensibly built panel... Right, they will never be in a majority, and it starts to become very obvious and embarrassing after like ten minutes of discussion. Yeah. Um, so at some at that point, you're just compromising your own credibility as a judge. So I say, don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good message to have. I think obviously sometimes you can be aware of those biases, maybe try to use them um, in terms of how you present your arguments and things like that. Obviously, there are some different characteristics, but I think like uh, good speeches win debate rounds, as yeah. always. And yes, I, I, yeah. I, I think people like, you know, you get better at debating if you stop thinking about yourself as a victim all the time. Again, another right-wing opinion I have, like I don't think a culture of victimization is helpful for people, especially those who are actually victims, right? Um, you know, when I came back from the UK and started doing a bit of debating in Singapore, I loved it because people were so much more open-minded and brave and really embraced the, the full diversity of debating, right? There was no sense of resentment or bitterness when they won or lost for any reason. They were eager to learn. Whereas I think in the UK, there was everyone was just so annoyed about themselves all the time. 
You know, I find it bizarre that until this day, I get put on panels because I am mixed race and I am queer. If you think of asexuals as queer, I don't actually care whether you think of me as queer. But I have never in my entire life been subjected to any discrimination or disadvantage which I can detect on the basis of my being a mixed race queer person. Right? But for the purposes of debating, I fulfill like a certain minority or vulnerable group underrepresented quota on panels, right? Um, the most crazy example of this was Cape Town, right? Where I ended up judging two finals because finally had to go deal with the all the chaos, which is all the protests which are going on outside. And they're like, we need like another brown dude. And then they were like, actually, she's a brown dude, go judge the open final. And I was like having lunch at like the water final had to rush back, right? Um, so I think people can get too hung, too hung up on this. Don't think of yourself as a victim, right? If you want to frame this in a progressive way in a debate, you say the, the worst kind of oppression is if you internalize it and start having low, low, uh, you know, low expectations of yourself, right? Um, yeah, I, I think victimization is not a healthy thing at all. I think this is one of the things that is fun about, um, right-wing debaters uh, i mean you're not a right-wing debater but like one of the motivation is kind of use the other person's logic against them oh so, yeah i love it I, yeah. I, i've always i've always found that fun like uh, okay let's uh, take your perspective on how you approach these issues even yeah. within that type of thinking this is a problem and in many of the cases i found that uh, uh this is a uh, great way to kind of break the liberal bubble yeah. but it's it's also showcases that some arguments are not right or left as more of the more logical position yeah. in a yeah. particular debate around you um, i remember there was this period you know when there was this lady rachel dolezal right who pretended to be black when she was actually white right people were really outraged about it and I remember thinking, it's really weird. Debaters hate, really hate as a cohort, right? Um, Trans-exclusionary radical feminists, right? They hate TERFs, right? Um, and I think they're probably correct. Like, TERFs are a pretty awful bunch of people. But it was weird that people started criticizing Rachel Dolezal using TERF logic. Like, people would say things like, sure, she identifies as Black, and she sees herself as Black, and she's part of the Black community, but she chose to be Black from a privileged position of whiteness. And I'm like, this is exactly why people say trans women are not women. It's exactly the same argument. Right? But this is like, you know, that is, these things happen in debating all the time occasionally. Then you realize, yeah, um, people are just kind of going, like just kind of just absorbing social signals about what they should believe and then just regurgitating them. It's kind of scary. Because you, you think of all people who should not be subject to this, debaters would not be subject to it, right? <laughs> but then you realize, oh God, debaters are just like part of the herd as well, right? Um, you know, you can, yeah, I suppose well, I'm a bit naive and I was surprised to find this out, but yeah. I was previously acquitted on these particular things that I'm going to say, but yeah, people are monkeys. Yes. Yes. And, uh, like you, you can look at it any way that you want, but I think like in many cases we use... If you are a intellectual, somebody who is, let's say, I think well read, you would start using these things that you've read about um, justifying how you're feeling about a certain point, not really um, giving it the um, intellectual conversation that it actually deserves. Because it's okay to disagree with certain aspects of. Uh, certain ideas without uh, you looking more or less extreme or whatever. Do you think there is a way to fix this? Uh, obviously, like currently, we care about this in debating. Like, yeah. regional, when we are making a debate panel, uh, we care about regional representation, um, mm. identity representation. Is, is there a better way to do it? Uh, when does it go too far? What, what do you think about this? I, you know, I think in most circuits around the world, it's not a problem which needs to be fixed, right? Because again, like the problem we're describing, really, to be honest, we're talking about some particular legacy circuits, right? Like North America, Iona, to some extent, Australia as well. It's not a problem in many of the circuits nowadays. Um, 
I, I think the biggest thing is just to convince people that uh, the people making these arguments or pointing out inconsistencies are not doing so from out of bad faith. Like, 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 because like, what really makes people react in a violent way to a different view is when they're convinced it comes from malice. Like, I mean, this is such a, a point many people have made, but it's really true, right? Um, and, and in some way, when you signal like, I am actually on your side, I would just like you not to have a dumb reason for believing the things you believe, right? Um, I think that's probably the most important thing. As a mechanism in actual debating, I don't think how we run tournaments or having more equity officers and so on and so forth, it's really the solution. I think the solution is actually role modeling. You know, it's having speakers who are able to debate um, in like an empathetic and intelligent way and to make these arguments in a way that even people who tend to react, you know, very tribalistically to certain arguments at least can see, right, okay, you know, this person's not insane, right? Um, yeah, but, but, you know, I, I think you're right. We're just apes, right? We're not terribly evolved. We are relatively primitive. We still have got a lizard brain, which is motivated by fear and tribalism and dominance and ritual and sex. And that's like 80% of what debating is, right? And then the 20% of all that technical, all that technical stuff with, with rhetoric and logic and everything, it's kind of a veneer, right? Um, I think what I think is generally, you know, I think if you look at your own political beliefs, and you realize you're comfortable with every aspect of your political beliefs, I think something's probably very wrong. Like that suggests that you have not actually thought about making them consistent. Because if you think about making your political beliefs consistent, you will end up whatever position you take in some really unusual, difficult positions, right? Um, and I, I just was, you know, I think outside of debating, I do wish people were more reflective about why they believe in the things they believe. And in fact, I'm much more inclined to trust a person's political beliefs if they have changed their beliefs in a big way several times. Right, because in my and you know, sort of blowing my own horn here, like my political beliefs have changed in a very radical way multiple times. I used to be a libertarian, then I went very far left, and now I'm just left. I don't identify as liberal, I am more left than I am liberal. Right. Similarly, my views on religion, right? I was very, very conservative and religious at one point, and then I became almost atheist. That was largely actually a result of debating. And now I consider myself very religious, but in a very specific liberal way. Um and I think you know, people should be a bit more vulnerable to having their beliefs attacked and changing them as a result. Yeah. I, I very much agree with you. I had a similar journey with my political beliefs and it's an ongoing journey. It's never going to be settled. But like when I started into debating, this was my first kind of entry into the um, realm of uh, politics, politics, uh, different positions on different types of issues. So I inherently became very, very um, left-wing mm -hmm. because of that. Then I had, like this is when I was a kid, then I had this moment of uh, like rebelling against that uh, in a debate context because I felt like uh, it, uh, we were kind of um, jerking ourselves off and not really thinking about the things that we are representing. And then I, like, uh, because of that rebellion, became more to the extreme on the right wing side, um, which of course I grew out of, and I kind of like, uh, I don't want to say I'm a centrist because I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah. I'd like to think about it as, uh, I use uh, some left winning arguments on certain positions and some right wing right arguments on other positions. I think that's a, a good way to think about it. And, what I will say is, I particularly liked what you said about the solution. I think uh, having more people that are um, like truly thinking about these things rather than being getting defensive when we are uh, having these conversations and being role models for uh, how we perceive these things in our community is something that uh, is generally, I think, the solution for, um, I, I think, a society as a whole. Like currently in Bulgaria, for the past two years, we've had five elections, we couldn't form a government. The, the, the people are extremely divided. Yeah. And it's very much upon like uh, the, the superficial concept is 
we have this old party that is very yeah. corrupt and we have the new party or the new people who are like very western etc et yeah. and i think many people will be like uh, oh my gosh i have no faith in this country how are there people who are um supporting these things or how are there mm. people even who are supporting putin and things yeah. like that and i think that's uh, obviously it's hard it's hard especially when like if you lose an election and you're on the good side you feel like uh, there is no point of redemption but in reality you have to take it in your own hands to really convince people yes. and yeah. uh, that's i think a powerful tool that debating gives to you to i think for the most part apart from like critical thinking about blah, blah, all of these things that we already know it is really the power to show what you're thinking to um use your thoughts and present them in a convincing way uh, and in, in the process of doing that you yourself uh, kind of evolve your own positions and think about these things and uh, this is what is powerful about the skills that we acquire to what we're doing here. yeah i think i think that's a very powerful point right it's is that actually um it's about learning to make arguments in a way that people can accept them because you actually know where the arguments are coming from like when i so after i finished debating i had to go back to national service right i had to go into a military unit and everything and obviously the military is generally not a very pro lgbt environment right you know but you know sometimes i have lunch conversations with these colleagues they've never you know debated at any point but then we've talk about issues to quite topical in Singapore at the time like gay marriage actually if you are if you really try and you listen to people and you're empathetic you can convince them like in half an hour from like being gay marriage is like the worst thing in the world to like it's totally fine um and and actually do do think that it, it's good that I debate it because that allowed me to understand where they were coming from um i'm very grateful that many of my friends don't have my political beliefs right i i really appreciate that I have lots of quite right-wing friends. Some of them more reactionary like Harish, some of them more principled like Tom Simpson, you know. But I'm glad of right-wing friends because they have really forced me to like make my views more coherent, right? Challenge me on points. Let me understand that actually there are certain things which, you know, my political parties do which are kind of dumb and stupid and should be stopped. Um and I would never have met people like that who were this persuasive and empathetic outside of debating. I think there's almost no chance. Right. And I think that's what debating really can be. And I think that's not currently what it is. But I think we're actually getting there. I think it's good, you know. I think that people like you obviously make a difference and help to push it in the right direction. Uh, thank you for your compliment. I think exactly the key word, the most undervalued skill in debating is empathy. Mm. Being empathetic to different positions than your own. It's always yeah. something that you can work upon but if you if you think of it from the perspective of how what should i do to win more debates 100% of the time i'll say think about do you have empathy for different types of points do you yes. really have empathy or do you have certain preconditions or what people get and not only having empathy for like minority groups or whatever you have actual empathy for the intellectual uh concept that these people are defending even if you completely disagree with it then we can have the conversation of you being persuasive in multiple types of scenarios and this is when you transcend the game in a way yeah. for my for me i think i think that is very beautifully put um you know that there, there is a thing which i've heard sort of people say about what philosophy ought to do but i think it's very apt for debating as well which is that debating should try and make strange things familiar and familiar things seem strange right like when you really realize like, like like the sheer diversity of human experience out there is way more than you can even begin to conceive of the concerns which people have you could never conceive of them right like um the the sheer wealth of big ideas about how society ought to be organized how we should relate to each other what parts of identity matter and what you know it's 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 crazy right and i think the least you can do as a debater is at least with like intellectual humility to be like you know there is something to be said for all of these 
right? And, and the point of me doing a debate is that I want to get to what makes these ideas persuasive. The, the key thing actually in debating, if you do it at really, if you do it really long, I think what makes speeches really effective is not that you understand an intellectual idea, it's something deeper, which is that you understand what makes an intellectual idea attractive to people in the first place, right? Because if you just look at intellectual idea, you might go, but this is some crazy theory, who would believe it? But then you go, but if you look at the context, why did this idea arise? In what society do people endorse this idea? Suddenly it becomes very obvious, right? It's important to realize that racism is super intuitive and attractive. I feel I have racist thoughts all the time. If I'm on the train and there are these smelly foreigners preventing me from getting a seat who are not talking my language, like I have an instinctive animal reaction of get the fuck out of my society. Right? And I think that there are certain ideas which lots of people could consider racist, but are actually quite fundamental to how we construct societies. I don't think societies can be maximally pluralist and accept everyone's kind of identity all at once without any kind of limitation. I think that doesn't work. I wish that was true, but it's not true. Right? Um, and like, debating lets you kind of get to these things, I feel. Um, not because you, you don't just adopt a blind attitude of, of, of critique, right? But an attitude of empathy. You see like, ah, right, okay, I can see where this is coming from. Yeah. Oh, right back at you, beautifully put. Beautifully put. I think uh, this is a great way to kind of uh, pack it all up. Um, one thing at the end that we always do is you can use this platform as your own. So you don't have any restraints, limitations. You are the leader of this discussion now. Well, so what, so I, I don't know, man, we've talked about so much. Right? Okay, maybe one thing I will say, right? And I think I feel this more as a dino, right? Is that I think there's a tendency, I think it's died down a bit, which is good, to kind of insult debating or to treat it like it's some slightly pathetic geeky activity, right? And if I'm perfectly blunt, most people who do this were never really successful at debating. And so it really is a psychological self-defense mechanism, right? It's a defense mechanism because they've taken an attitude that what makes debating worth doing is whether or not they've won tournaments. By definition, only a minority of people will ever be successful, right? Um, so I think that, you know, if there's sort of two things I kind of encourage people to do a bit more. Like, firstly, like, don't be so bitter about it, right? The fact that, you know, you might have gotten an unfair call. Or something, none of that really matters. If you can kind of actually become a slightly more empathetic and understanding person through debating. The second thing is actually more about sort of dinos in general, right? Like, I think it's really tragic that most other hobbies, it's kind of normal for you to do them throughout your life. If I play badminton, which I do, I would expect to play it throughout my life. It would be weird for me to be like, well, now I'm out of university. I shouldn't do badminton. That's just a bit weird, right? Why? Like debating is an intellectual game. It enlivens the mind. It's a, it has a clear moral and valuable purpose. Um, I think we ought to try and create a debating culture in which we celebrate people doing it way after they have quote unquote retired, right? Because it's something they love. We would not say of a person who collects stamps when they are 60, well, it's a bit sad it didn't stop when they were 25. Why should we say that of debaters, right? Um, so yeah, I, I do wish we could kind of view debating more in this context rather than in some kind of geeky niche activity. Um, but yeah, that's probably the last thing I, I, will, I will I'll say for this uh, podcast. 100% agree with you. It's, it is a game that we enjoy and we should be celebrating people, uh, getting the chance to enjoy it even more. Uh, maybe like keep the cup for worlds or whatever, but in terms of like... Uh, competitions in general and everybody has their own timeline um, like uh, me and Roman we started debating internationally much later because literally we didn't have money to go to competitions before yes we had, had jobs so and if, if you think about it Nikki don't you know so many adults in your life who would benefit from doing a bit of debating like you know people who are so shallow and parochial and close-minded that you'd be like, damn, if only you, you know, you should do this activity because it really improves as a person from it, which is something we don't tend to say about debating, but I think it really does improve people in that way, right? 
And I mean, another reason we should we should not stop at a particular time is because the new ideas keep coming out, right? When I started debating, intersectionality was not a thing and I didn't know about it. Now I do, and I think it's good because now I understand that aspect of how people relate to the world and their identity, right? Um, you know, AI was not a really big thing when I started debating. Now it's a huge thing. Um, or even things like, you know, proto-fascist movements in liberal democracies. Not a really huge thing when I started. Now they're a big thing. Like, and I want to remain engaged about these things, right? Um, not necessarily say I want to debate about them, but it's totally understandable, right? Why someone who's excited by ideas, you see that, like, ideas don't die at a particular point. They keep coming out and you want to keep talking about them. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, I've seen so much, like after um, seeing, like for example, because uh, after Worlds um, in Bulgaria, we did get a lot of coverage from the press, and like uh, my bo boss found out, uh, found out about it, my colleagues found out about it, and there was so much starvation of people between like all ages. I'm talking 30, 40, 50 years old, yeah. and they're like. We should do debating. Uh, we should organize debate within the office. Uh, are there debating clubs so that uh, my friend and me, we are 45 years old, can go to and do all those things? So, I mean, uh, we should uh, we should be celebrating now, embracing that everybody everybody has uh, their own place in what we are doing uh, beyond identities, mm. and I think that's been quite the underlying topic of this whole conversation. I'm so happy that uh, we've had it. And it's a great uh, way to also end it. So thank you very much uh, for being my guest. Uh, this has been genuinely probably my favorite conversation so far. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I love all my other guests as well, but uh, um, it, it truly didn't feel like a podcast or whatever, just uh, as always, I say I'm doing all of these things because it's a great excuse to talk with people like you and uh, uh, chit chat about uh, fun things, some controversial, some not so much. Thank you very much for joining. Well, thanks a lot. I've had an amazing time. Yeah, and I like this has not felt like a podcast. It's been like we're at a tournament, you know, there's been a like something has gone wrong with the tab and we're sitting outside. <laughs> just having a conversation about stuff which is what i love about debating these days but yeah no well thanks a lot for having me on uh and yeah i'm glad you enjoyed it